Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at this, the Port Keys LH5P Mark II. Let's get going. So the monitor comes in a nice little plastic container, which is always handy if you want to be able to store it in a bag or a backpack and have something to stop it getting scratched. I really like the build quality. It feels really solid. It feels like a professional piece of kit. It's fully made of metal by the looks of it. Very thin and compact. Yeah, I really, I really like the design of it. On the back is the battery holder. It takes Sony MPF style batteries. And beside that, we've got a small antenna, which you just screw on. On the top, we've got four function buttons and the power button in the middle. And then to the right of that, you've got menu and exit with a plus and minus button. On the left side of the monitor, you've got an HDMI in and out port, so you can do pass through. And in the middle is a headphone output. It looks like metal inputs and headphone output. So yeah, it looks good quality. On the bottom is a single threaded connection, although it does look like there's locating holes for uh, locking pins. On one side, we've got a remote input, which enables you to connect a cable to cameras that don't have the Wi-Fi capability. Although this one didn't come with a cable, so I assume you have to supply that yourself. On the other side, we've got a USB type A input, which is for loading LUTs and likely firmware updates and stuff. And next to that is a multi-pin input, which works either as a power input or a motor control if you've got the required hardware to do that with it. Uh, in the box, it does come with a cable that connects to this port, uh, which you can use to power the monitor if you've got something like a, you know, an external battery or other power source. There's a USB stick that contains some LUTs, uh, probably a firmware update, things like that. And there's a couple of information cards in there for if you need to access the manual, etc. Okay, so let's get this attached to the camera and then I'll get set up and then I'll show you some of the features that are in the monitor. So let's go into the menus and see what it can do. So on tapping on the screen, the first thing we see is what they call the settings screen. So down the left, we've got all of the various options for making settings. And when you select those, you get a row of settings that can be changed along the bottom. You can see the two dots right at the bottom there. That shows that there's more than one page of settings. So I can scroll that over and you can see there's one more setting. So I'll scroll back. We'll go into a bit more detail in these settings a bit later on. So next up, we've got the flip options. Uh, this allows you to flip both vertical and horizontal as well as flipping just the on-screen display. It can be a little confusing this one because if you just do a horizontal flip, then the text is inverted as well. So you have to make sure if you want to be able to read it, unless you're going to be looking in a mirror or something, that you also do the vertical flip. So this is handy if you want to be able to mount the monitor upside down for any reason. So now if I toggle on this OSD flip mode, what that does is it enables those two extra switches on the right there, horizontal flip and vertical flip, and they will only affect the on-screen display, not the actual image. So this next option allows you to adjust what the plus and minus buttons do on the top of the monitor. So as you can see, there's quite a few things you can uh, set this to. Uh, I've been using this a little while and I like setting this to backlight. So that means that I can just increase or decrease the brightness of the monitor without having to go into the menu. And you can see that here as I uh, come out the menu, I can still adjust that just using these buttons on the top. This monitor does get very bright. It goes up to, as you can see on the box, 2200 nits and it feels very bright as well. So I do believe that. And a bit later on, you'll see uh, when I tested this outside, uh, it's, you know, it works really well out in the sunshine. The next setting screen allows you to adjust the language. It's also got an option that allows you to change the on-screen display transparency. Although, as you can see here, for some reason when I change that, it literally just seems to change the brightness of the color of it. I don't think it's actually transparent at all, but uh, I actually quite like it set to high anyway. I prefer it when it's you know a darker color. Next up, you've got a choice of two speeds of the fan. The low is very quiet. You can barely hear it. And when you switch it to high, then the fan just goes faster and is a lot noisier. I'll show you the difference now. So 
Certainly with the low setting on, I can't see the sound of this fan ever being a problem. And next we've got the option to change the display gamut. Uh, there's a few different options in here, but I just have mine set to bypass at the moment. And if I swipe onto the next page, you'll see there's an option to change the black level. So the next option is gesture zooming. Now, while this seems like a really good idea and it does work, I found it to be a little bit unreliable. And you can see here that as I try to zoom in and then zoom out, sometimes it doesn't respond and sometimes it responds in strange ways. So I didn't have much luck using this setting. So I just kept this turned off. Next up, we've got the page that allows you to load and use 3D LUTs. The monitor does come loaded with a few LUTs, but it's dead easy to load more. You just put them onto the uh, included USB stick or any USB flash drive. And then as you can see here, as soon as you connect it to the monitor, you can navigate into it and then you just find the LUTs that you've put on there. I've loaded a couple of my favorites on here, the uh, Leaming LUT and the Phantom LUT. So I'll show you how you load them onto the monitor. You literally just navigate through to them and then when you click on it, it will load it in and store it in the memory on the monitor. You don't have to have an SD card. There's no SD card slot. It literally uses internal memory to store it. There are a few pre-installed LUTs on here, but uh, I prefer to use the ones that I'm used to. So I've loaded them on now. So with that loaded, you can see all the LUTs uh, at the bottom and you can scroll through these and find whichever one you want to apply. So I'll scroll along until I see the Leaming LUT and then apply that one. Finally, the last option in the settings menu allows you to adjust the output volume for the headphones. So the way you access the different menus on the monitor is quite interesting. To access the settings menu that we're on now, you just have to swipe left on the screen at any point and that'll go straight in. And if you want to access the function menu, you swipe right. So on the left and the right here, you can see uh, various icons that relate to the features that the monitor has that you can use. And you can rearrange these however you prefer. I've kind of arranged these so that, you know, I've got the most used ones first and I'll show you why I've done that in a moment. But these are very easy to adjust. As you can see, you just touch the icon and then swipe into the screen. And then you're presented with um, a list of options that you've got available. When you choose one of those options, that option then populates that slot. Once I've got the one I'm happy with, I just press the back arrow and then that stays there. So let's start by looking at the zebras. You'll notice that when I first select it, we still see the basic information being displayed along the bottom. In order to change the parameters, you just press the settings icon on the right of the screen. So there's two ways to turn on each of these features. We can just press the icon again, and then the center part of that will go yellow, which means that that's turned on. Bottom left is actually an on off toggle. So this is another way you can switch on and off the feature without actually having to use the main icon. So there's two ways of doing it. You either use the icon to toggle it on and off, or you can press the uh, little switch at the bottom. So as you can see, zebras have got two levels. You've got high and low, and each of those can be enabled or disabled individually. And each one has its own IRE setting. Now, one thing to bear in mind here is that with the low setting, anything below that setting is going to be have zebras. And with the high setting, anything above that is going to have zebras. There's no way to individually say what the range is for each of these settings. So it makes it a little bit more problematic for judging something like skin tones, where you only want to highlight a specific brightness. So it's not quite as detailed as some other monitors in terms of zebras, but we do have some other tools for doing that. So that's just one thing to bear in mind with this. And also for the high and low settings, you can choose between one of the four colors. So you can set one of the colors for the upper zebras and another color for the lower zebras. Okay, so next we'll have a look at peaking. Uh, in peaking, there's two options. You've either got original style or black style. So with black, it literally only shows you the in-focus areas, which I guess can be quite useful, but uh, I usually prefer just keeping it so I can see the image and also see the peaking on top. Uh, then you've got a sensitivity setting that goes from 1 to 15, and this is really useful. There's, there's a wide range of sensitivity there rather than just low, medium, high like you get on the camera. It's nice to have uh, you know more of a range of options here, but you can also change between the four colors as well. 
Uh, one thing I would say here is that we've got the same four colors for both zebras as you've got for Peking. So you have to be careful to choose different colors so that it's not confusing. It's a shame we can't have just standard black lines for the zebras and then just keep the colors for the Peking because that's kind of generally how most monitors work. So next up we've got waveform and this is actually uh, a good waveform and, and really useful. I'm not so keen on the massive text on the lines. I'd prefer them if, if it could be a bit smaller so that it wasn't so bold on the, on the screen. We can change between the blending options which makes the waveform display more transparent the higher you set it. And then you can also adjust the brightness or the intensity of the display. I really like the warning option because if you, if you enable that then anything that goes over the high limit will turn red which is kind of just a nice indicator that you may need to pay a bit more attention to the exposure. You can also choose to put the waveform in any of the four corners or toggle it between two different sizes. Okay so next up we've got false colour. There's two options in here. You've got ARRI or user. So the ARRI option literally just shows anything under, anything over, and then either side of where normal skin tone exposure might be. And that's a really nice setting actually. I find that to be less overbearing than normal false colour, and it's giving you the kind of important information. Although it would be nice still to be able to adjust the points at which the kind of middle skin tone areas are set. Because if you're shooting something like log, or you're not shooting log, and it'd just be nice to be able to adjust those. So in the user false color, you can actually adjust the under and over warning levels, which is really cool. Uh, the under warning shows up bright pink, which I think actually would have been nicer if it was uh, you know, dark blue or something, but nonetheless, it works well. And then the over warnings show up in red. So it's nice to be able to adjust those. And that's actually not something you often see on other monitors. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a nice option. It'd also be nice if you could adjust the kind of central values as well, but I guess they are kind of an industry standard. So yeah, I think the false colors work well. Next we've got an RGB waveform. This works really nicely and it's got similar controls to the Luma waveform. So you can adjust the transparency, you can adjust the brightness of the display, and also you have a warning option on this one as well. Uh, instead of going red here, when you go over the warning level, then the display turns white. Again, you can toggle this between two sizes and move it around the screen uh, into each of the four corners, depending on where you want it. So next up, we've got the audio meters and these are implemented quite nicely. I like the fact that it shows the stereo signals. So if you're using something like a stereo mic, then you get a, you know, a good reference of what's going on there. And you can put these top, bottom or at the sides. I prefer having them at the bottom. I find at the top is a bit overbearing and it causes me to reframe my shot differently. Whereas at the bottom, that doesn't tend to happen. Uh, you can also make them semi-transparent or translucent using the switch there. And if you want to swap the left and right channels, you can do that using the toggle as well. So next up, we've got the control for the LUT. And in here, it literally just turns it on and off. Uh, as you can see, press the toggle to turn it off and press it again to turn it back on again. One feature that I think is really cool with this one is if you come back out to the main options, you'll see there's an option to apply the 3D LUT either before or after the data. So this means that if you prefer to see the waveform and the, um, and the metering tools just applied to the data that's coming to, from the camera, you can do that. Or if you prefer to see the metering tools displaying the data after the LUT's being applied, you can do that too. So it's nice to have both options here, whereas on something like the Atomos monitors, you know, as I said in a previous video, if you've got the Shinobi, that doesn't apply the LUT to the tools. And if you're using the Ninja 5, that does apply the LUT to tools. So it can be a bit confusing. So it's nice when using this monitor that you can actually work either way and have the option to, to do that. So while we're looking at this screen, uh, also on here you can see whichever LUT is being currently used. You can also adjust the backlight brightness. You can change the fan speed from low to high. It shows you the current voltage of the battery. And this is a little bit disappointing because it doesn't actually show you, you know, a percentage remaining in the battery. So you kind of just have to learn you know, what, at what point your battery is likely to die. 
And then finally, the uh, little cog icon just takes you to the list of available options for the function display. This is the same as if you swipe one of the icons into the screen. So the next option we've got is rectangle crop. And I do find this one a little bit disappointing. On other monitors, if you've used something like two times punching or four times punching, then this kind of does something similar, except that there's a kind of really drawn out process where you need to set the size of the box, you need to set the start point and end point. And then once you've done that, then you can drag that around on the screen and you can punch into that area. Um, but it's just a little bit finicky. As you can see, once you've set the rectangle, if you punch in and you've got the menu displayed, it kind of scales it a bit strangely. So that's one thing to bear in mind. But, but once you've got the menu out of the way, when you use the feature, it does work as you would expect. So next up, you've got a histogram. Again, you can position it in any of the four corners and change the size of it. I like the way you can also toggle the background to be transparent. Uh, it's a bit of a shame that when you do that, it doesn't also get rid of the bounding box because that makes it you know, a little bit more distracting on the screen than it has to be. But then I guess you do need to be able to see you know, at what point it is reaching the edges. However, I do like the way they've implemented this. It works well. I also really like the way they've implemented the guides as well. Uh, I don't like it on monitors when guides are literally lines and you can still see past them. Although you do have that option here. Uh, you can change through multiple different aspect ratios. And then as well as that, you've got the option here called masks and that enables you to make the background area black. For me, I find having those areas black really helps, helps me to visualize what it is I'm filming and I'm not distracted by the area around and, I, and it gives you a, a better visual understanding of how the frame looks, I think. And there's also a user option so that if you want to define something, you know, which is, you know, out of the ordinary, then you can do that as well. Finally, you've got the option to change the color of the line around the mask. Personally, I like to have this black so that it just looks like it would do if it was displayed on, on a screen. However, if you like to have the bounding line, one of the other four colors, you, know, you can just use those too. There is also the option to add a center crosshair. And as you can see, there's also options here to adjust the X and Y offset of the crosshair. Next up, you've got grids. These go from the usual two regions all the way up to nine regions. So if you don't want to use the rule of thirds and you'd rather use the rule of ninths, then uh, you can do that. So that covers most of the uh, features that you can use in the function menu. There are a couple of others. Uh, you can see in here, you can add in um, an HDR option. So I'll drag that over to the side. And then I'll, you can also put in a record stop start option. So when you connect this to a camera via Wi-Fi, which we'll look at in a moment, then you can start recording using the monitor as well. So popping back into the settings interface, you can see that uh, we've got the ability to change between different anamorphic options. Uh, the default is called one times anamorphic, which is a little bit confusing, but that's what you need just to sort of display exactly what's coming from the camera. You can also change through various other anamorphic options. In the middle here, you've got the ability to set the color temperature of the monitor. At the moment, it's set on manual, and I haven't really adjusted any of these values. They're all at default. But if you're so inclined and you want to be able to adjust the red, green, and blue channels, you can do that. So next up, we're going to look at what is likely the most interesting swipe you can do on this screen, which is swiping down. But before this will do anything useful, we need to connect the monitor to the camera. So I'll show you how to do that now. So you start on the FX3, go into the menu, go to the network options, and then look for control with smartphone. So the first thing to do is switch that to on and then go down to connection. And then when you see the option, you need to press the uh, custom button 4, which changes it to connect with password. So once you've done that, you go to the monitor, make sure Wi-Fi is turned on, and it should see the network being provided by the camera. Press on the network and then it asks you to enter the password that's displayed on the back of the camera. Once you've typed that in and pressed OK, it can take a couple of seconds and then it all activates and then you can access the features from the camera. 
Okay, so top left it shows you the currently selected shooting mode. But next down is where it gets really interesting. So we've got an option to control focusing and this one is extremely useful. So in here you can see we can control uh, the focus in quite a lot of ways. Uh, to begin with, we've got a record start stop, which is useful. But then the next icon along does a one touch focus. So wherever you've got the focusing zone set up on the camera, touching that button will instantly make the camera focus to that point. So the next button along allows you to toggle between the touch focusing options. So you can choose between touch focus. And then if I touch the guitar in the background, the camera will literally focus on the guitar. But likewise, if I touch on the color checker here, the camera will slowly do a focus pull onto that. And you can see that uh, reflected on the back of the screen in the camera as well. On this wider shot, you can see the camera moving the focus point around on the camera's display. If I change to touch tracking and select an area on the corner of the color checker here, you can see that the camera is tracking that and keeping that in focus, uh, all done through choosing that area on the monitor. And again, we just press that same button to cancel the tracking. When you start recording on this monitor, as you can see, you actually get a red line around the monitor. Now, this is something I was screaming out for on the Atomos Shinobi, because even though it's not a recorder, and this one isn't a recorder either, it's still nice to be able to look at your monitor and know whether or not you're rolling. So uh, I really like this feature. So yeah, kudos to Port Keys for adding that one. So the next button is simply a toggle between autofocus and manual focus if you need it. And then all of the arrows afterwards allow you to manually control focus. Now, to be honest, I don't find these very useful at all. It'd be nice to have just like a scroll option but I think this is probably a limitation of the camera because I know they do do that with other cameras. And you'll see as I hold these down that it's not a steady focus of movement at all. It's uh, like a, a series of steps. It's not smooth at all. So yeah, unfortunately, I've, the manual focusing isn't particularly useful. But to be honest, that's not something I would really use anyway. I mean, literally, this is mounted to the top of the camera. You can just reach down and control focusing on the lens. So, you know, while that doesn't work very well, that really wouldn't bother me at all. And scrolling to the right, you can also choose between the various autofocus zones as well. So on my FX3, I've limited the focusing zones to wide zone an expanded spot, which is why you can only see these three options. If you've got more enabled on the camera, then obviously you will see those in here too, and you'll be able to select them in this menu. And you can see that as I press these, uh, the actual zones being displayed on the back of the camera, you know, are being displayed in line with my choice. Okay, so next down, you've got options for controlling iris, shutter, and ISO, as well as white balance. Now we'll start with the iris. You can see that uh, you can actually slide this slider around to adjust iris. And you'll notice that as I slide this around, it doesn't actually change until I let go. So you can't kind of just drag this around and see the result. You have to kind of drag it to a certain point. This isn't something I, th I can see myself using when it's an easy change on just using the one of the control dials on the camera. But what I do find incredibly useful is the fact that I can see my iris setting on the monitor. I don't have to keep looking down at the little screen on the back of the camera. So to me, this this, this is amazingly useful. Uh, likewise with shutter speed, you know, you can change that the same way, either by dragging the slider or by using the buttons on the end. And you can see that affecting the exposure as well as we go. And then moving on to ISO, same thing. You can adjust it using the slider and it displays the ISO on the right and on the left of where the icon is. Uh, finally, we've got an option to change white balance and by selecting that you can choose between all of the main white balance options and you can even go into your custom settings and choose one of those. One really nice thing is if you go into the uh, Kelvin control, like the manual white balance Kelvin, you can then change the color temperature by using the CT button on the top right of the screen. So here you can see by selecting CT, 
Uh, I can drag the slider around, which is changing the current color temperature of the camera. Uh, or likewise with the others, I can use the arrows on the right hand side as well. So that's a nice little feature. And finally, uh, the EV option, if you're using some kind of auto exposure, then that enables you to adjust the exposure offset. So as you can see here, I've enabled uh, auto shutter speed, and now I can use the EV setting to adjust the exposure offset uh, using the slider or the buttons again. And of course, all of the information being displayed works uh, the other way as well. So if you go into the camera and change the setting, then the information is updated on the monitor. The LH5P Mark II also features a motor control interface, and you access this by swiping up on the monitor. Now, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to test this because I don't have any equipment it'll work with, but it certainly looks like an interesting addition for the monitor. Let's finish off by having a look at the uh, buttons on the monitor and just seeing what they do. So first up, we've got four function buttons, and these relate to the first four items that you've put into the uh, function interface, so the top left four. And the nice thing about these is when you're shooting and you haven't got the menus open, you can literally just press these to toggle those options on and off. So on the other side, we have the menu control buttons. Uh, these do work okay. You can press them to enter the menu and then you either use the plus and minus buttons to then navigate up and down or left and right. Pressing the menu again goes further into the menus and it does work. It takes a little while to get your head around the way it works, but it's so much easier pressing the touch screen. I can't see anyone really using these unless for some reason they don't have access to the touch screen. I do find the plus and minus button useful because you can assign that to a function. So I've got mine assigned to brightness up and down. So that's generally the only, the only time I've been using those buttons. Okay, so one nice thing about this monitor is it does have the ability to display a lot of the features at the same time. So I'll start by uh, turning on the zebras and you can see that's displaying. Um, and then we'll add the uh, waveform display. So we've now got both of those. I'll turn on the audio meters, they're now displaying. We'll add in an aspect ratio guide for good measure, along with maybe a, a center cross as well. So we're looking quite busy now, but uh, we can do a lot better than this. So I'm also gonna add in the histogram display. Uh, we'll just move that over because we don't want that on the same side as the waveform. There we go. Now here you can see one thing which does bug me a little bit. And that is that the zebras are being displayed over the histogram. And you'll notice that's kind of a bit of a theme with this monitor. Not only the zebras applied to the user interface, but so does the peaking. Not only have we got peaking showing on the items in the frame, it's also showing on the, on the, on the frame around the aspect ratio box. And also on the crosshair in the middle of the frame as well. And you can see here, if I turn the zebras off, you know, you can see the histogram looking how it should, which is clear of the zebra pattern now. Uh, I can also turn on the grid, and you can see here that the uh, peaking is also showing on the grid display as well, which again is a bit of a shame. It'd be nice if that was clear from the, from the peaking. I'm sure probably that's something they can sort out in a future firmware update. But nonetheless, it's pretty cool that we can use all of these tools at the same time. So yeah, there's some really cool features in here. It's fantastic being able to see the exposure settings from the camera and especially being able to control the focus like that. Um, but let's head outside, we'll take it out into the sunshine and we'll see how the monitor performs in daylight. So outside here, it's a gorgeous day, really bright, really sunny. And what I've done is I've set the uh, monitor on the camera to its sunny setting, which is as bright as it can get. And I've set the port keys monitor also to its maximum brightness. So you can get a good comparison between how these two look. And you can see that the port keys monitor is viewable in the sunlight. Uh, I think any monitor does require some shade if you're really gonna be looking at it with the sun shining on it. But this is easily usable. It's a lot easier to, to gauge focus using the, the port keys monitor than it is with the small screen on the camera. These are NPF 750s, they're not original Sony's, so this probably could vary depending on the quality of the battery. But these ones are marked as 5,000 milliamp hours. 
On maximum brightness, I was getting around two hours and 11 minutes out of one of these. Just by reducing the brightness to five, which is half brightness, that extended up to about three hours and 45 minutes. So having the brightness set lower makes a substantial difference. And with all the features that I've shown you, I think this is a fantastic option for the FX3 and likely for many other cameras as well. Certainly some of the UI features are a little bit uh, quirky. You know, the, the sort of pinch to zoom, maybe not so good. And I don't like the fact that it doesn't show you battery percentage. One thing I do have to report that may change with firmware, and as I say, this is very early on, um, was I did see a little bit of banding. So I have spoken to Portkeys about this and they said that their technicians are looking into it. But if I hear anything back, and I'll post down in the details. So hit the show more option below to look for any updates. Other than that, I'd say it's a fantastic choice, having the ability to see your camera settings in the monitor and control touch focus like that. Yeah, I'm really excited about this. So I hope that was useful. If you have any questions, then please, as always, leave comments below. And I thank you for taking the time for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.